Chapter 16, Part 3 of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume 2, by John Fox. Edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter 16. Persecutions in England during the reign of Queen Mary, Part Three. Martyrdom of Rollins White. Rollins White was, by his calling and occupation, a fisherman, living and continuing in the said trade for the space of twenty years at least, in the town of Cardiff, where he bore a very good name amongst his neighbors. Though the good man was altogether unlearned and withal very simple, yet it pleased God to remove him from error and idolatry to a knowledge of the truth, through the blessed reformation in Edward's reign. He had his son taught to read English, and after the little boy could read pretty well, his father every night after supper, summer and winter, made the boy read a portion of the Holy Scriptures, and now and then a part of some other good book. When he had continued in his profession the space of five years, King Edward died, upon whose decease Queen Mary succeeded, and with her all kinds of superstition crept in. White was taken by the officers of the town as a man suspected of heresy, brought before the Bishop Landuff, and committed to prison in Chepstow, and at last removed to the castle of Cardiff, where he continued for the space of one whole year. Being brought before the bishop in his chapel, he counseled him by threats and promises. But as Rollins would in no wise recant his opinions, the bishop told him plainly that he must proceed against him by law, and condemn him as a heretic. Before they proceeded to this extremity, the bishop proposed that prayer should be said for his conversion. This, said White, is like a godly bishop, and if your request be godly and right, and you pray as you ought, no doubt God will hear you. Pray you, therefore, to your God, and I will pray to my God. After the bishop and his party had done praying, he asked Rollins if he would now revoke. You find, said the latter, your prayer is not granted, for I remain the same, and God will strengthen me in support of his truth. After this the bishop tried what saying mass would do, but Rollins called all the people to witness that he did not bow down to the host. Mass being ended, Rollins was called for again, to whom the bishop used many persuasions, but the blessed man continued so steadfast in his former profession that the bishop's discourse was to no purpose. The bishop now caused the definitive sentence to be read, which being ended, Rollins was carried again to Cardiff, to a loathsome prison in the town, called Cockmorell, where he passed his time in prayer and the singing of psalms. In about three weeks the order came from town for his execution. When he came to the place where his poor wife and children stood weeping, the sudden sight of them so pierced his heart that the tears trickled down his face. Being come to the altar of his sacrifice, in going toward the stake, he fell down upon his knees and kissed the ground. And in rising again, a little earth sticking on his face, he said these words, Earth unto earth, and dust unto dust, thou art my mother, and unto thee I shall return. When all things were ready, directly over against the stake, in the face of Rollins White, there was a stand erected, whereon stepped up a priest, addressing himself to the people. But as he spoke of the Romish doctrines of the sacraments, Rollins cried out, Ah, thou wicked hypocrite! Dost thou presume to prove thy false doctrine by Scripture? Look in the text that followeth. Did not Christ say, Do this in remembrance of me? Then some that stood by cried out, Put fire, set on fire! Which, being done, the straw and reeds cast up a great and sudden flame. 
in which flame this good man bathed his hands so long until such time as the sinews shrank and the fat dropped away saving that once he did as it were wipe his face with one of them all this while which was somewhat long he cried with a loud voice o lord receive my spirit until he could not open his mouth at last the extremity of the fire was so vehement against his legs that they were consumed almost before the rest of his body was hurt which made the whole body fall over the chains into the fire sooner than it would have done thus died this good old man for his testimony of god's truth and is now rewarded no doubt with the crown of eternal life the reverend george marsh george marsh born in the parish of deanne in the county of lancaster received a good education and trade from his parents about his twenty-fifth year he married and lived blessed with several children on his farm until his wife died he then went to study at cambridge and became the curate of rev lawrence saunders in which duty he constantly and zealously set forth the truth of god's word and the false doctrines of the modern antichrist being confined by dr coles the bishop of chester within the precincts of his own house he was dept from any intercourse with his friends during four months his friends and mother earnestly wished him to have flown from the wrath to come but mr marsh thought that such a step would ill agree with that profession he had during nine years openly made he however secreted himself but he had much struggling and in secret prayer begged that god would direct him through the advice of his best friends for his own glory and to what was best at length determined by a letter he received boldly to confess the faith of christ he took leave of his mother-in-law and other friends recommending his children to their care and departed for smethahills whence he was with others conducted to latham to undergo examination before the earl of derby sir william norris mr sherburne the parson of garpnell and others the various questions put to him he answered with a good conscience but when mr sherburne interrogated him upon his belief of the sacrament of the altar mr marsh answered like a true protestant that the essence of the bread and wine was not at all changed hence after receiving dreadful threats from some and fair words from others for his opinions he was remanded to ward where he lay two nights without any bed on palm sunday he underwent a second examination and mr marsh much lamented that his fear should at all have induced him to prevaricate and to seek his safety as long as he did not openly deny christ and he again cried more earnestly to god for strength that he might not be overcome by the subtleties of those who strove to overrule the purity of his faith he underwent three examinations before dr coles who finding him steadfast in the protestant faith began to read his sentence but he was interrupted by the chancellor who prayed the bishop to stay before it was too late the priest then prayed for mr marsh but the latter upon being again solicited to recant said he durst not deny his saviour christ lest he lose his everlasting mercy and so obtain eternal death the bishop then proceeded in the sentence he was committed to a dark dungeon and lay deprived of the consolation of any one for all were afraid to relieve or communicate with him until the day appointed came that he should suffer the sheriffs of the city amory and cooper with their officers went to the north gate and took out mr george marsh who walked all the way with the book in his hand looking upon the same whence the people said this man does not go to his death as a thief nor as one that deserveth to die when he came to the place of execution without the city near spittlebotton mr caudry deputy chamberlain of chester showed mr marsh a writing under a great seal saying that it was a pardon for him if he would recant he answered that he would gladly accept the same did it not tend to pluck him from god 
After that he began to speak to the people, showing the cause of his death, and would have exhorted them to stick unto Christ, but one of the sheriffs prevented him. Kneeling down, he then said his prayers, put off his clothes unto his shirt, and was chained to the post, having a number of faggots under him, and a thing made like a firkin with pitch and tar in it over his head. The fire being unskillfully made, and the wind driving it in eddies, he suffered great extremity, which notwithstanding he bore with Christian fortitude. When he had been a long time tormented in the fire without moving, having his flesh so broiled and puffed up that they who stood before him could not see the chain wherein he was fastened, and therefore supposed that he had been dead, suddenly he sprang abroad his arm, saying, Father of heaven, have mercy upon me, and so yielded his spirit into the hands of the Lord. Upon this many of the people said he was a martyr, and died gloriously patient. This caused the bishop shortly after to make a sermon in the cathedral church, and therein he affirmed that the said, Marsh was a heretic, burnt as such, and is a firebrand in hell. Mr. Marsh suffered April 24th. 1555. William Flower. William Flower, otherwise Branch, was born at Snow Hill, in the county of Cambridge, where he went to school some years, and then came to the Abbey of Ely. After he had remained a while, he became a professed monk, was made a priest in the same house, and there celebrated and sang Mass. After that, by reason of a visitation and certain injunctions by the authority of Henry the Eighth, he took upon him the habit of a secular priest, and returned to Snow Hill, where he was born, and taught children about half a year. He then went to Ludgate in Suffolk, and served as a secular priest about a quarter of a year, from thence to Stunneland, at length to Tewkesbury, where he married a wife, with whom he ever after faithfully and honestly continued. After marriage he resided at Tewkesbury about two years, and thence went to Brosley, where he practiced physic and surgery. But, departing from those parts, he came to London, and finally settled at Lambeth, where he and his wife dwelt together. However, he was generally abroad, excepting once or twice in a month, to visit and see his wife. Being at home upon Easter Sunday morning, he came over the water from Lambeth into St. Margaret's Church at Westminster, when seeing a priest named John Keltham administering and giving the sacrament of the altar to the people, and being greatly offended in his conscience with the priest for the same, he struck and wounded him upon the head, and also upon the arm and hand, with his wood-knife the priest having at the same time in his hand a chalice with the consecrated host therein, which became sprinkled with blood. Mr. Flower, for this injudicious zeal, was heavily ironed, and put into the gatehouse at Westminster, and afterward summoned before Bishop Bonner and his ordinary, where the bishop, after he had sworn him upon a book, ministered articles and interrogatories to him. After examination, the bishop began to exhort him again to return to the unity of his mother, the Catholic Church, with many fair promises. These Mr. Flower steadfastly rejected. The bishop ordered him to appear in the same place in the afternoon, and in the meantime to consider well his former answer. But he, neither apologizing for having struck the priest, nor swerving from his faith, the bishop assigned him the next day, April 20th, to receive sentence if he would not recant. The next morning the bishop accordingly proceeded to the sentence, condemning and excommunicating him for a heretic, and after pronouncing him to be degraded, committed him to the secular power. On April the 24th, St. Mark's Eve, he was brought to the place of martyrdom in St. Margaret's Churchyard, Westminster, where the fact was committed and there, coming to the stake, he prayed to Almighty God, made a confession of his faith, and forgave all the world. This done, his hand was held up against the stake, and struck off, his left hand being fastened behind him. 
Fire was then set to him, and he, burning therein, cried with a loud voice, O thou Son of God, receive my soul, three times. His speech being now taken from him, he spoke no more, but notwithstanding he lifted up the stump with his other arm as long as he could. Thus he endured the extremity of the fire, and was cruelly tortured, for the few faggots that were brought being insufficient to burn him, they were compelled to strike him down into the fire, where, laying upon the ground, his lower part was consumed in the fire, whilst his upper part was little injured, his tongue moving in his mouth for a considerable time. THE REVEREND JOHN CARDMAKER AND JOHN WARREN On May 30th, 1555, the Reverend John Cardmaker, otherwise called Taylor, prebendary of the Church of Wells, and John Warren, upholsterer, of St. John's, Walbrook, suffered together in Smithfield. Mr. Cardmaker, who was first an observant friar before the dissolution of the abbeys, afterward was a married minister, and in King Edward's time appointed to be a reader in St. Paul's. Being apprehended in the beginning of Queen Mary's reign, with Dr. Barlow, Bishop of Bath, he was brought to London and put in the fleet prison, King Edward's laws being yet in force. In Mary's reign, when brought before the Bishop of Winchester, the latter offered them the Queen's mercy if they would recant. Articles having been preferred against Mr. John Warren, he was examined upon them by Bonner, who earnestly exhorted him to recant his opinions, to whom he answered, I am persuaded that I am in the right opinion, and I see no cause to recant, for all the filthiness and idolatry lies in the Church of Rome. The bishop then, seeing that all his fair promises and terrible threatenings could not prevail, pronounced the definitive sentence of condemnation, and ordered May 30th, 1555, for the execution of John Cardmaker and John Warren, who were brought by the sheriffs to Smithfield. Being come to the stake, the sheriffs called Mr. Cardmaker aside, and talked with him secretly, during which Mr. Warren prayed, and was chained to the stake, and had wood and reeds set about him. The people were greatly afflicted, thinking that Mr. Cardmaker would recant at the burning of Mr. Warren. At length Mr. Cardmaker departed from the sheriffs, and came toward the stake, knelt down and made a long prayer in silence to himself. He then rose up, put off his clothes to his shirt, and went with a bold courage unto the stake and kissed it. And taking Mr. Warren by the hand, he heartily comforted him, and was bound to the stake, rejoicing. The people seeing this so suddenly done, contrary to their previous expectation, cried out, God be praised, the Lord strengthen thee, card-maker, the Lord Jesus receive thy spirit. And this continued while the executioner put fire to them, and both had passed through the fire to the blessed rest and peace among God's holy saints and martyrs, to enjoy the crown of triumph and victory prepared for the elect soldiers and warriors of Christ Jesus in his blessed kingdom, to whom be glory and majesty forever. Amen. John Simpson and John Ardley John Simpson and John Ardley were condemned on the same day with Mr. Cardmaker and John Warren, which was the 25th of May. They were shortly after sent down from London to Essex, where they were burnt in one day, John Simpson at Rochford and John Ardley at Rayleigh, glorifying God and his beloved Son, and rejoicing that they were accounted worthy to suffer. Thomas Hawkes, Thomas Watts, and Anne Eskew Thomas Hawkes, with six others, was condemned on the ninth of February, 1555. In education he was erudite, in person comely and of good stature, in manners a gentleman and a sincere Christian. A little before death, several of Mr. Hawkes' friends, terrified by the sharpness of the punishment he was going to suffer, privately desired that in the midst of the flames he should show them some token whether the pains of burning were so great that a man might not collectedly endure it. 
This he promised to do, and it was agreed that if the rage of the pain might be suffered, then he should lift up his hands above his head towards heaven before he gave up the ghost. Not long after, Mr. Hawkes was led away to the place appointed for slaughter by Lord Rich, and, being come to the stake, mildly and patiently prepared himself for the fire, having a strong chain cast about his middle, with a multitude of people on every side compassing about him, unto whom, after he had spoken many things, and poured out his soul unto God, the fire was kindled. When he had continued long in it, and his speech was taken away by violence of the flames, his skin drawn together, and his fingers consumed with the fire, so that it was thought he was gone, suddenly, and contrary to all expectation, this good man, being mindful of his promise, reached up his hands, burning in flames over his head to the living God, and with great rejoicings, as it seemed, struck or clapped them three times together. A great shout followed this wonderful circumstance, and then this blessed martyr of Christ, sinking down in the fire, gave up his spirit, June 10th, 1555. Thomas Watts of Balyrica in Essex, of the Diocese of London, was a linen draper. He had daily expected to be taken by God's adversaries, and this came to pass on the 5th of April, 1555, when he was brought before Lord Rich and other commissioners at Chelmsford, and accused for not coming to the church. Being consigned over to the bloody bishop, who gave him several hearings and, as usual, many arguments, with much entreaty, that he would be a disciple of Antichrist. But his preaching availed not, and he resorted to his last revenge, that of condemnation. At the stake, after he had kissed it, he spake to Lord Rich, charging him to repent, for the Lord would revenge his death. Thus did this good martyr offer his body to the fire, in defense of the true gospel of the Saviour. Thomas Osmond, William Banford, and Nicholas Chamberlain, all of the town of Coxall, being sent up to be examined, Bonner, after several hearings, pronounced them obstinate heretics, and delivered them to the sheriffs, in whose custody they remained until they were delivered to the sheriff of Essex County, and by him were executed. Chamberlain at Colchester, the 14th of June, Thomas Osmond at Manningtree, and William Bamford, alias Butler, at Harwich, the 15th of June, 1555, all dying full of the glorious hope of immortality. Then Reothesley, Lord Chancellor, offered Anne Askew the king's pardon if she would recant, who made this answer, that she came not thither to deny her lord and master. And thus the good Anne Askew, being compassed in with flames of fire, as a blessed sacrifice unto God, slept in the Lord, A.D. 1546, leaving behind her a singular example of Christian constancy for all men to follow. Rev. John Bradford and John Leaf, an apprentice. Rev. John Bradford was born at Manchester in Lancashire. He was a good Latin scholar, and afterward became a servant of Sir John Harrington, knight. He continued several years in an honest and thriving way, but the Lord had elected him to a better function. Hence he departed from his master, quitting the temple at London for the University of Cambridge, to learn, by God's law, how to further the building of the Lord's temple. In a few years after, the university gave him the degree of Master of Arts, and he became a Fellow of Pembroke Hall. Martin Bucer first urged him to preach, and when he modestly doubted his ability, Bucer was wont to reply, If thou hast not fine wheat bread, yet give the poor people barley bread, or whatsoever else the Lord hath committed unto thee. Dr. Ridley, that worthy bishop of London and glorious martyr of Christ, first called him to take the degree of a deacon, and gave him a prebend in his cathedral, Church of St. Paul. In this preaching office, Mr. Bradford diligently labored for the space of three years. Sharply he reproved sin, sweetly he preached Christ crucified, 
Ably he disproved heresies and errors. Earnestly he persuaded to godly life. After the death of blessed King Edward the Sixth, Mr. Bradford still continued diligent in preaching, until he was suppressed by Queen Mary. An act now followed of the blackest ingratitude, and at which a pagan would blush. It has been recited that a tumult was occasioned by Mr. Bournes, then Bishop of Bath, preaching at St. Paul's Cross. The indignation of the people placed his life in imminent danger. Indeed, a dagger was thrown at him. In this situation he entreated Mr. Bradford, who stood behind him, to speak in his place, and assuage the tumult. The people welcomed Mr. Bradford, and the latter afterward kept close to him, that his presence might prevent the populace from renewing their assaults. The same Sunday in the afternoon, Mr. Bradford preached at Bow Church in Cheapside, and reproved the people sharply for their seditious misdemeanor. Notwithstanding this conduct, within three days after, he was sent for to the Tower of London, where the Queen was, to appear before the council. There he was charged with this act of saving Mr. Bourne, which was called seditious, and they also objected against him for preaching. Thus he was committed, first to the tower, then to other prisons, and after his condemnation to the poultry compter, where he preached twice a day continually, unless sickness hindered him. Such as his credit with the keeper of the king's bench, that he permitted him in an evening to visit a poor sick person near the steel-yard, upon his promise to return in time, and in this he never failed. The night before he was sent to Newgate, he was troubled in his sleep by foreboding dreams, that on Monday after he should be burnt in Smithfield. In the afternoon the keeper's wife came up and announced this dreadful news to him, but in him it excited only thankfulness to God. At night half a dozen friends came, with whom he spent all the evening in prayer and godly exercises. When he was removed to Newgate, a weeping crowd accompanied him, and a rumor having been spread that he was to suffer at four the next morning, an immense multitude attended. At nine o'clock Mr. Bradford was brought into Smithfield. The cruelty of the sheriff deserves notice, for his brother-in-law, Roger Beswick, having taken him by the hand as he passed, Mr. Woodruff, with his staff, cut his head open. Mr. Bradford, being come to the place, fell flat on the ground, and putting off his clothes unto the shirt, he went to the stake, and there suffered with a young man of twenty years of age, whose name was John Leaf, an apprentice to Mr. Humphrey Gowdy, tallow chandler of Christ Church, London. Upon Friday before Palm Sunday, he was committed to the Compter in Bread Street, and afterward examined and condemned by the bloody bishop. It is reported of him that when the bill of his confession was read unto him, instead of pen, he took a pin, and, pricking his hand, sprinkled the blood upon the said bill, desiring the reader thereof to show the bishop that he had sealed the same bill with his blood already. They both ended this mortal life, July twelfth, 1555, like two lambs, without any alteration of their countenances, hoping to obtain that prize they had long run for, to which may Almighty God conduct us all through the merits of Christ our Saviour. We shall conclude this article with mentioning that Mr. Sheriff Woodruff, it is said, within half a year after, was struck on the right side with a palsy, and for the space of eight years after, until his dying day, he was unable to turn himself in his bed. Thus he became at last a fearful object to behold. End of chapter 16, part 3